So now we got to watch what we say, especially you, Bev. We got to yeah. watch you. <laughs> At least I got the cat out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? The cat doesn't talk, does it? <laughs> she does. She talks loudly. <laughs> Usually walks across the screen, you know. How that yeah, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that many times. So, well, let's get started. I'm going to keep an eye out for uh, participants and and keep them coming in if they show. And uh, but let's get started here. So, first of all, um, gosh, thank you guys, all of you, so much for for coming on here today. Uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate uh, seeing every one of you, and uh, uh, we really. Mm, enjoy the learning process for everybody. And I think we're, we're making inroads to do that. Um, and there's a, there's a few different stroke survivor meetings going on now. Um, and uh, they all seem to be doing well and, and we're seeing a definite upswing on that. So um, usually I ask people, cause um, like I said, last time we had, you know, quite a group, I ask people to raise their hands if they got a question. And I try to keep everybody's conversations to three to five minutes. With a little smaller group, we've got a little more leadway. So we can um, you know, ask better questions and take our time a little bit if we, if we need to. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, some of you um, are new, like Cecilia there. And um, I don't know who all's heard this, but I'm gonna go into just a little bit about uh, stroke, um, <laughs> stroke awareness, Oregon, um, just so you all have some knowledge about it. Um, we say our mission is guided by care and care is collaboration, awareness, recovery, and education. Um, and so the collaboration piece is where we talk with hospitals, other PTs and, and people like that. And then the awareness part is the FAST campaign uh, where it's face, arm, speech and time and um, making that a household safety word. And then the R in care is recovery. And that's where we do these stroke meetings. Uh, we develop resources and support for the stroke patients and their families. Um, we, um, we meaning, uh, stroke awareness, Oregon, uh, are doing a lot of that. We started a peer to peer program now where we go one-on-one -on -one to people, um, and talk with them one-on-one -on -one because a lot of times people need that and they don't want to be in front of a group. And so we do that and, um, get to, you know, helping people with what they want. So, um, in the recovery aspect, we do these stroke warrior meetings. We do them twice a month, every second and fourth Tuesday. We have a men's club meeting that's uh, on Zoom. It's the third Wednesday at 4 p.m. Uh, we do the younger stroke survivors every third Monday at 6 p.m. And that is run by Alicia. And the men's club is run by Ralph. And then the caregivers meeting is the first Wednesday at 3 p.m. And that's Molly uh, who runs that and she's doing a fabulous, they're all doing a fabulous job. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> then the last piece, so that was collaboration, awareness, recovery, and then education. Uh, and our goal is just to educate families, um, and businesses, uh, on the key elements of what stroke is all about. And we're really making some huge headways on that. Um, and, getting the word out. And this is part of what, you know, part of what we're doing here is, is, uh, getting the word out. So that's what care is about. So now, uh, I want to introduce Laura. Laura was, um, a resident of Bend for a while. She was uh, working at the hospital there and she was on the board of directors actually for stroke awareness, Oregon for a little while. And she's the stroke and telestroke program manager for Providence, St. Peter in Olympia right now. Uh, some of us have known her for a while, like I said, and she was in Bend for a couple of years. We really appreciate you coming on today, Laura. Um, a quick story I wanted to tell. So uh, I was invited to go to this class 
that uh, she was conducting for the college uh, in Bend um, for physical therapists. And, you know, really, I didn't know what to expect when I went there. And being a stroke survivor myself, you know, I thought it was going to be interesting to go and, and hear what she was teaching them. And I go to this meeting and I mean, it was a huge class. I don't know how many people are in this classroom, but it was huge. And um, she just, um, she just killed it. I'm not joking. Uh, it was awesome to hear all that she was saying. And she really knows her stuff inside and out. And although she hasn't had a stroke, which is good, uh, she really understands uh, us and, and what we're all about. So um, that's it. And Laura, welcome to, to the meeting today. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, I It's funny because I feel like I'm I just got out of a meeting and I'm going into one after this, so I might have to exit a little early. And I'm afraid that after that lovely introduction, I'm not going to know anything I'm saying because I'm so tired. So I hope I don't disappoint. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I figured I could kind of, you know, I don't know if you want me to like start a conversation or if you want me to kind of go into some specifics about strokes and stuff that we deal with on the hospital side. Um, well, one thing, one thing I would like to do is, is hear if there's anything that's new coming down the pike, so to speak, that you think would be pertinent for us to hear. I'd love to hear that. And then, frankly, I would love to almost open it up and let you um, go into some question answer and talk about uh, anything. And Cecilia, you are welcome to to ask questions as well. Let's let's keep this open and let's, uh, you know, make sure we get everybody um, answered or questions answered. So. Great. Um, so actually Cecilia, I appreciate one of the things I wrote down to mention. Um, but we were talking about kind of, I, when I was coming on here, I was thinking about like people identify the general population identifies strokes as being something that is, um, you know, one unilateral weakness or one-sided weakness, we call it, or you see facial droop or trouble speaking. And that is typically what we think of as a stroke and everybody's mind goes there. And what people don't seem to understand um, the general population and even healthcare providers in certain circumstances is that there's so much more in a stroke. The brain is the most complex organ. So when you have a stroke, it's, it's an insult, an injury to something that is very unique to each one of us. It is never the same. It is never, we can never predict what is going to happen. Um, and some things that are getting looked at right now, you know, um, are depression after stroke. And we, we've actually had conversations here. Is it, um, is it a result of having the stroke and the injury to the brain? Is it the result of the new life that has formed? And really, you know, is allowing ourselves to have patient, patience with what's going on going to help guide us through that? There are some studies currently going on that are looking at um, starting patients, every stroke patient on, on antidepressants prior to leaving the hospital. Um, there's no result from those meetings, uh, from those studies currently. Um, we're waiting to see how that goes. But I mean, it's really diving more into all these things that can occur that are out of what we think of in that kind of stereotypical box of what a stroke looks like. And um, I'm glad Cecilia is here, even though we're not supposed to know why, um, because one of the things we do um, deal with a lot on the hospital side is something called dysphagia, um, which is trouble swallowing. Um, and I've been reading studies uh, upon studies in my job to try and figure out um, how many people suffer from this. And again, you look at how everybody's an individual and we don't know exactly who will and who won't. And the studies say somewhere between 30% and 70% of people that have strokes develop this trouble swallowing. Um, and that can lead to complications. And there are actions going on in hospitals across the country to try and mitigate this before it becomes a problem. Um, so, you know, there's all these different things. I guess my point is, you know, impulsivity is another one that we look at is that um, they've shown that um, after strokes that people have um, inability to regulate impulsivity. Um, there's a higher incidence of addiction or there's a higher impulsivity with drinking or spending and stuff like that. 
Um, so all of these things, and I go back to what I was saying, is that you have to be patient with yourself and understand that this is a new, um, a new being that you're kind of existing in. And hopefully, I'm actually waiting for you guys to tell me stuff because I like to then go back and teach um, my caregivers or teach, um, you know, the community about things and what to look for that are outside of what that picture is that the world has presented that fast poster that's not who you are right that fast right. poster is not who you are and that's that's not what a stroke is there's so many more things going on i guess that's my point sorry well so <laughs> laura let me interrupt you for a second yeah. assuming you were finishing up on on that initial deal so i'm thinking of monica um i'm going to let monica talk for a minute here in just a second because um, she is one that um, um, definitely deals with the swallowing issue. And, um, you know, I also want to, you know, and we all know this, we've all gone through the, the depression side of things. Not, not everybody, like uh, a friend of ours, Kim, she did not experience that. But I would say she was a, an anomaly, frankly, on that. Um, she just got a great attitude, but, uh, I went through it. I went through it huge. Um, and I uh, see Arnie shaking his head and, and so, but let's, if we can, Laura, I'd like to hear Monica talk a little bit first, uh, because Monica, this hit right on the point, did it not to what you're talking about with swallowing and stuff? Do you want to talk for a second? Um, yes. When I was in the hospital, I had a cerebellar hemorrhagic stroke and uh, a craniotomy and um, I really I could not read because the muscles in my eyes didn't work and I could not effectively swallow because muscles in my throat didn't work together either and so I had a feeding tube initially and uh, Actually, I remember my first dream that I had when I was in the hospital. I woke up and it was one image. It was of an orange, a slice of an orange. And I had a hunger for orange juice, fresh squeeze, which eventually I got. But um, I'm now two and a half years out and no feeding tube that I had for about uh, four months, and uh, but I still have difficulty swallowing thin liquids, so I still have to thicken them, which is a challenge, uh, which I continue to do. Uh, I don't. At the hospital where I was and in the rehab facility, they were uh, really religious about testing for uh, swallowing. And so I probably had uh, three tests within, uh, I'd say, a month and a half. Um, uh, and the tests are quite good. The only thing I do not know about is um, if there's anything that can help the muscles to coordinate. And that I would be interested in. I don't know if that's what well, you had in mind, Keith. It is. It is. So let's let Laura uh, answer if, if possible, Erin. So I am going to tell you honestly that that I am not the best one to answer questions as far as uh, that goes. I don't know. On, I don't mean to do this to you, Cecilia. I don't know if you have, you know, this is um, much more your expertise than mine. If you um, know any answers or have any thoughts on that question. Yeah, I would just ask Monica, how far out from your stroke are you? How long has it been? Two and a half years. You said two and a half? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, the timing has a lot to do with it, how long how long it's been. But there's been really good results from a 
a specific training called the McNeil Dysphagia Therapy Program, MDTP. And the idea is, you know, it's just like any other muscle or function that you're trying to regain control of. You do it intensely, repetition of swallows uh, on very basic, you know, if for you it's liquids. So um, that's actually a little easier. So liquids, you just keep going, keep swallowing, keep practicing that the best way to regain swallow function is to actually swallow. All of the exercises are not as effective as actually swallowing and just building yourself up slowly. And it's a program, so it's not something I'd recommend doing on your own, but the program is, is you know, under watchful eye and there's a very strategic plan to when you progress and when you have to step back. But um, because it's in, in more of an intensive program, you do it, you do something every day and and you kind of build up. So that's that's, I do think that there are good outcomes with something like that. But McNeil dysphagia. McNeil dysphagia therapy program. And you could just look to see if somebody is certified in the M yeah, MDTP. But you know, every just as Laura was saying in the beginning, everybody is different. And so it's just so hard to know. Thank thank you so much for that. Arnie, did you want to shoot? Yeah, I just want to tell Laura, you know, I'm three and a half years post-stroke and I still have problems swallowing. You know, I really have to think and be careful and take my time. Uh, and and Laura, um, after three and a half years, I finally got control over my uh, impulsivity because I had it bad. I mean, I was really bad. I lost a, a really good friend over it. Uh, but, you know, I finally, I want to say within the last six months, have really Feel, felt comfortable with my impulsivity and feel, feel really feel like I got into control over it finally. Arnie, what is that? that? What is Brian, that? Brian, say what, that again, please. What is impulsivity? So impulsivity means um, like control over impulsive behaviors. So behaviors that you just kind of want to do that maybe you shouldn't do or aren't the best idea. Um, sometimes after somebody has a stroke, what happens is that they, they lose control of that kind of stop mechanism that says, don't do this. Um, it could be, you know, yelling. It could be continuing to drink. It could be shopping. It could be so many different things. I say shopping because I have that issue on my own, but we can talk about that another time. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of things that, um, that people kind of lose that ability to stop and control themselves the way that somebody would before having this occur. Oh, so, so that until so like, um, so in other words, if I'm, if I'm correct, so in other words, it's like, um, so in other words, it's like, uh, and you go to, let's say you go to a store and you see something and you want it and you want to get it and that's, that would be like impulsivity, if I'm correct. It would be taking it. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. So it could be getting it or another thing that could be impulsivity would be like maybe eating, like you're overeating or you, you can't mm -hmm. stop yourself when, when somebody would sometimes stop before their stroke. So there's um, a lot of different things that it can be related to. Um, and it goes back to kind of as individuals, we have, you know, different, the brain is so complicated. It's, you know, I did heart attacks for a long time in my career and, you know, it's kind of different depending on where your heart attack is, but it's, it's not that complicated, but for, for somebody like their stroke can look similar to yours and it can just manifest itself or look completely different than what yours looks like. Um, and it's hard for people to understand that sometimes. Okay, thank you for explaining that to me. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Matter matter of fact, you know, uh, in a meeting that I was in this morning, we were talking and and you know, crying. How many of us in here who are stroke survivors cry and we never used to, or did at least after our stroke and never used to? I mean, seriously, you drop, know, cried a drop of a hat, Keith. 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I, I would go into business meetings and I would sit there and cry like a baby and I could not control myself uh, on that. And so uh, I think as we grow, as we continue down the journey and we continue to work on our journey, okay, which uh, I'm a true believer, as everybody knows, um, then we'll get better and better and better and it never stops. So um, I didn't mean to take the ball from you, Laura, at all. So uh, any, uh, let's, let's keep going with some questions for Laura. You're talking about PPA, right? Um, I don't know. Is that what it is, Laura? PPA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, wait. I know. I'm not sure. PP cover effect. Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Joyce. Oh, that's. Uh, I one well, time a man lost his job. He was crying. I was laughing. Mm -hmm. I was laughing and surely and laughing because it was a job. I had to leave the room because I knew it wasn't a. A, a crooks response, but I, I I couldn't help it. Yeah, it's the same way as crying. And Michelle, you experience that in a big way, do you not? She's coming. Yeah, I take new dexter, new dexter for it. Okay, it's a. I'm trying to copy and paste a thing here for you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, anyway, yeah, she she goes through that as well, that pseudo yeah. effect. Well, Ms. Sherwood set that up um, announcement in the announcement. I hear somebody's is that Michelle? Is that your is that your phone kicking back? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> I, uh, I hope I'm not sounding like rude, but anyway, so uh, thank you, by the way. Um, so where are we at here now? Impulsiveness. I want to talk a little bit about that as well. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> uh, well, and being patient, being patient with yourself, right? I mean... <laughs> Everybody who has a stroke, it seems, they think, uh, you know, gosh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be all better. And that is a rare, rare situation. Uh, we have talked to so many people with stroke and, uh, and it just doesn't happen. And so then they go through a depression, frankly, a lot of times uh, because they didn't bounce back. I was one of those cases. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Laura, at all? Um, I mean, and that's part of kind of what we talk about is, is there um, part of it is that you can go through depression because your stroke can actually chemically alter your brain. Mm -hmm. But part of it is that you have, and it can be both too, but part of it is that you have this new situation that you have to now exist within. And it's finding, we go back to the patients, right? Like giving yourself the space to be able to, to give yourself time and, and not rush yourself and to forge forward. But at the same time, know that this is a long, you know, marathon, this is not a sprint. And this is something that over time will improve, um, will help with that side of it. Um, you know, and also knowing that that's a possibility that there is a depression component to this disease process and being open with your doctors and, and telling them, you know, so that you can get help when needed. They need to be treating you in a holistic way. This is something that kind of over the past 20 years in medicine has become more evident, right? I mean, 40 years ago, it was, you know, we look at strokes as this is their brain and this is what happened and this is what we're treating. You know, we never thought of the whole being and that's really changed in medicine is that we take care of a whole person now. And part of taking care of the whole person is being patient with ourselves, communicating mm -hmm. with our providers when things we don't necessarily think have to do with our stroke are going on because it could be directly related to your stroke. And there are things we can do to support you. 
Well, and so I'm going to make a comment on this. So uh, that's where my frustration was, okay? Uh, because I felt that there were lots of PTs and um, lots of people who would help me on the physical side of things, but I couldn't find anybody to help me with the mental side. And it was the mental side uh, that really uh, busted me down. And so I feel like you were just saying, and I love hearing that, you know, um, they're, they're going into the depression after stroke. And of course, the, the big guns out there are starting to go down that road. Thank God. And that's why I built my program. And I'm not going to go into that. But that's what it's about is to help people get their mental um, capability back and get back on the positive side of things because depression can be uh, a killer. Uh, you know, I almost took my own life. Uh, I'm not joking about that. Uh, it was depressing. And so, um, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. Monica, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Um, well, I think for all of us who have had strokes, it's a profound experience in life. I mean, and in my career as a psychologist, what I was very aware of is that people often came when some big life event happened to them and because it was challenging to process it and they sought some kind of support. So I'm hoping that um, it becomes more widespread and available. And truthfully, I am not a fan of psych meds. In some instances, they can be helpful, but many times doctors don't know what to do, so they give you a pill. And that's not what we need as stroke survivors. We need somebody who can help us, who can care about what we're going through and uh, help us to deal with our feelings about it. Absolutely. Right on the money, Monica. You know, uh, I'll bet that most of us had, well, I, I shouldn't assume anything, but how many on this call had an antidepressant uh, drug given to you after you went through your stroke? You know, many of us, okay? And um, we may still be taking it. Uh, and I don't mean any offense by this, but I finally, after a couple of years, I just said, you know what, I, I'm changing that. I, I didn't ask for permission. I just started easing my way off of it. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. Of course, that's just my own story. But um, I, I think Monica's right on the money on that. They give those to you because they don't know. Now, Laura, uh, you know, please, I'm so sorry. I, I feel like I'm taking over. Uh, You're fine. Interject for us. Um, I mean, I think if we're looking back at what we were talking about, you know, I think there's always a component, no matter what the reason is for depression, there's always a component of, you know, talking and support and stuff that's needed. So I don't want to negate that with the medication discussion. I think, um, you know, that there are people that medication therapy will help bridge and they might not need to be on it forever. There are people that won't need it at all. And I certainly don't think it's an, it's always an answer. I tend to be of the, of the same type of mindset where it tends to be a band aid, and there are issues that we can, you know, talk through and work towards um, that will help us in the long run. Um, but what I did want to say when you were talking, Keith, um, that depression can lead to, you know, it, it can be an, a life ender is that it's not just for those of us that, you know, think depression and, and maybe suicide or something that can result from depression. There are forms of depression that are a lot more silent that can be just as deadly, especially for those that suffer from stroke. You know, you become less less wanting to exercise or some people eat more when they're depressed. And all of these things are really a, a part of preventing that next stroke from occurring. You know, I mean, so that's another piece that we kind of have to think about when we think of this is maybe I'm not so depressed that, you know, it's that visually obvious, but it's that I, I become sedentary and I eat more and I eat, you know, 
certain things that are not the best choices. And that contributes to, you know, maybe me not making the healthiest choices. Well, and so I'm going to, I'm going to make a comment on that. So, uh, you know, we go into COVID and COVID is a, you know, shit storm. Sorry, Bev, but, you know, but the good news is it caused uh, a bunch of us, SAO, and, and there's other outfits out there who have now uh, really worked on doing this, what we're doing right here, allowing people to come in on Zoom and voicing themselves and having a conversation about different topics that we need to be talking about. Whereas before, you know, everybody went to the hospital or they went somewhere and they did that. Now it's open and we can get a lot more people and we can affect and help so many more people. And so um, because of that, uh, I'm thankful for that, frankly. Um, I, have a I have a question. Brian, go um, ahead, Brian. Heath, um, this question is for you. Um, what made you not take your life? If you don't mind me asking. I'm glad you didn't take your life. Yeah. So, okay. Um, and, you know. I'm glad you're still here. I'm going to keep it as short as I can. So I was, I literally, right after my stroke, my wife went back to work and I was at the house all by myself. And I was looking out this window and I was like, what good am I? What good can I be? And I went through uh, a bunch of stuff of uh, depressing thoughts. And I was seriously going to take my life. I'm not joking about that. And then I started thinking about, wait a minute, I'm here for a reason. Okay. Now I went through, you know, you guys, I, I was a Christian man. I still am, but I went through some problems at that time. I was like, why would God do this to me? And uh, I was really going through it. And I thought, what good is my family going to be without you know, me and I had a lot of life insurance, Brian. Um, I was a business owner. I had a lot of life insurance. And so uh, then I just said, you know what? I'm here for a reason. There's something out there that I'm supposed to be doing to help other people. And that's when I started this journey. And I started thinking about that. And every day, and you can take a step forward and two steps back, but you got to keep thinking about what you can do. And you got to you got to change. A lot of us have to change our outlook. You know, you can't do what you used to be able to do, but you can find something. And so that's where that's at. I hope that helps, Brian. Yeah. Um, if I may ask, if I may say something. Um, last night, I was, last night, I was looking at the um, sermon at this church in New Jersey. And this lady, she was preaching, and she talked about um, she talked about purpose, and that everybody is for purpose, and um, you just gotta um, you just gotta you just gotta find your purpose in life. And I'm glad you're still here. I'm glad you didn't. I'm glad you didn't choose the other route. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. The one other thing I'm going to say on that, though, bud, is if you're struggling with that, and e this goes out to everybody, you can find a new purpose. You can find a passion and a purpose. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. I'm not, I'm not struggling. I'm not struggling with that. I just want to, I just want to ask, you know, what, what made you not, you know, what, what you know, I like the question I asked before, but. You know, I just I was just curious. Well, thank you, bud. And I don't usually like to say much about myself. Um, uh, Laura, you you're up. But if anybody else wants to chime in quickly on what Brian said, uh, I want to keep these to two minutes or so because we are, you know, I want to make sure I'm watching the time. We've got a lot more people now. Um, hang on one second, Monica. Let's see if any does anybody else have anything they want to say first. Okay, Monica, go. Okay, so Keith, I think we're all glad that you made a decision to be here and to support us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank but you. I'm Thank thinking you. in terms of Laura and hospital work. You know, when I was in rehab, I had PT, I had OT, I had speech, 
uh, and they had the doctors, the physiatrists who came in, and a neuropsychologist once a week. And but really, there was nobody who came in just to talk about the experience of the stroke. No one that came in to uh, talk about my feelings. No one, although I sometimes had those conversations. But I'm I'm thinking that it would really be helpful if in rehab facilities, they added that as a, a dimension of rehabilitation. Laura, Laura, can I just make one more comment? I'm so sorry. So sorry. And, and then you're going to go, I'm so sorry to, I feel like I'm just controlling this, but Monica, <laughs> one of the things that Stroke Awareness Oregon has done now, and we're just launching it, is we started a peer-to-peer -peer program. And so then Steve Van Houten, who is heading that up, has gone to the hospital, has met with the PTs at the hospital and gotten approval. And we have a whole document on it now. And so we're starting this process so that we can then, as stroke survivors, Fantastic. go talk to a stroke survivor. Okay, because I said this morning on the meeting that we had, not everybody wants to be in a group like this, there are people who want individuality. And I get that. In the beginning, in the beginning, it's terrible. Exactly. So uh, where did, um, I lost, there you are, Laura. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, I have to say, I am learning so much from all of you, and I'm, I'm going to take everything we're talking about here, and this doesn't necessarily include me supporting you, but rather you helping me support the nurses to know what to do better when you're hospitalized. Um, but every time I um, speak to uh, stroke survivors or stroke warriors, I go back and um, I incorporate it into my teaching when I lecture to nurses. Um, and so I think that, you know, a very important part of it is, is maybe they need to be, they're there. <laughs> maybe when you're in the hospital piece, not after, but they're there for that first part where this is a life altering experience. And, um, you know, them understanding, that's a big part of a lot of the lectures I do is understanding that this is a complete, complete life change for you guys and that we need to be there to support you and listen um, and whether that you need to yell or you need to cry or you need to laugh or whatever it is that you need to do um, that need you need to have a space that's safe um, you know it's, it's it feels like sometimes in this world that you're supposed to meet everyone else where they want you to be but I think in this case when somebody has a stroke when somebody has a lot of actual neurologic injuries that the world needs to be able to meet you where you are and where you are is perfect for that day and we can help you get somewhere for the next day but we need to be that support for where you can be for that day if that makes sense that was awesome and and oh my gosh i wish everybody was like you on that um and anyway that was awesome uh lara we appreciate that bev go ahead yeah, I'm 24 years after my first stroke, so I'm a long-term stroke survivor, and I had two strokes, hemorrhagic strokes. I have a rare brain disease called Moya Moya, and uh, anyway, making a long story short, I escaped <laughs> into work. I became a workaholic. Hmm. Um after my strokes, I, I did everything. In fact, I even went to another country to study. And, you know, um, I arrived in a wheelchair. Two years later, I walked off the plane carrying my own luggage. I did everything myself because at that point, nobody knew what to do with a stroke victim. And we were victims then, you know, I mean, they, they gave me this brain that I was supposed to squeeze to build up my muscles in my hand. That was it. I had no PT, no speech therapy, nothing. And I had aphasia for a while, but that fortunately got over with uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I was trying to do a dissertation and I would cry because I couldn't remember how to spell the. And I had 750 pages to write mm -hmm. on 
a theological <laughs> issue and it was really you know uh, it wasn't for spell check i wouldn't have made it but i did get it <laughs> in spite of everything and even before my brain surgery was for the moya moya so I, I mean yeah things have changed a lot which is great and that's important but we need to keep moving forward instead of looking backward and uh, I would never want somebody that had a stroke now to have to go through what I went through. Yeah. You, you know, know, Bev, um, you, uh, I love your story. And of course, I just I care a lot about you as well, just as a person. You know that. Um, but one of the things that, that she reminded me to, to say in this, and, it, and Brian brought it up as well, is, you know, focusing on others and helping other people in whatever format that is, is a great way for us to take our eyes off of ourselves and our own problems and find a new path for ourselves. So Laura, did you want to comment? Um, oh, hi, Lane. Laura, you look wonderful. Oh, thank you. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Did you want to go ahead? I, I just have a quick comment after you're all done. Okay. Um, I was I was gonna say to Beverly that um I've been in healthcare for over 20 years. I've been 22 years now. Um, so when and I always start my lectures like this for the new nurses so that they understand the journey of where we've come from with medicine, but when when something when somebody would have a stroke when I first became a nurse and even a nursing assistant before that it was just a label it was like this this is what happened to you and now this is who you are and this is who you're going to be yeah. and that's how we understood it and there were no treatments there was like you said there was no follow-up physical therapy because we felt like once you were discharged your journey was over and this is what you had yeah. and it has just grown into you know as we understand more and more about people and how we are all individuals and how you know neuroplasticity and there's so many things that we're learning about that that we can say this is a, a lifetime of growth and and you're constantly getting better and improving and and being able to do more and overcoming things um you know i mean treatments have changed as well so it's treated differently on the hospital side but just talking about the recovery piece like our understanding has completely changed awesome uh Lonnie, go ahead i just want that um add a quick comment um, so I went through a lot of depression. Well, I won't say a lot. I, the way that my depression has come is it's really been in waves. So yeah, I had that initial, you know, probably within the first year, oh my gosh, you know, how do I live without an arm? All this kind of stuff. And then what I found, I'm now nine years out. Um, what I found now is I still have depression, but it seems to come more in waves. And then I'm better equipped to work out of it. Mm -hmm. So I find that for me, you know, when I do it, when I ramp up my physical therapy, some of my therapies and some of the other things I'm doing, it really, really helps pull me out of that short-term depression. Love and it. so I think if we could learn to, to teach stroke warriors, we're probably always going to have some be really prone to depression. Something happens in our life. Maybe we react differently than we would have prior to the stroke. But if we can equip people to have better skills and be prepared for that, I think that would be huge. I mean, I know for me, I'm probably always going to face these waves of depression. Awesome. Michelle, that was, that was a great point, uh, Lonnie. Love it. Go ahead, Michelle. I have a bad memory, so I wrote myself a note. Okay. This is in regards to what Monica said about having an older stroke person come. I had a bilateral pond stroke in 2013 when I was 43. And I was at Shirley Bryant <laughs> Ability Lab for half a year. And they actually did that. But the thing is, I'm kind of the opposite. I wouldn't talk to her. I made John talk to her because I was like, so I think it depends on the person. 
Like they should ask if you would want that. Very good. It, you know, there's a there's a part in us, okay, and it, it can be male, it can be female, it can be whatever, that we uh, can be embarrassed by this new person that we are. And it's hard to come out of that. And it's hard to face that. And uh, that could be even a little part of that. Do you agree, Michelle? Well, for me, it was more like, I don't, it was kind of like, I don't care where you're at because I'm here and mm. that's so far away. Like, it was more that. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Very well said, Michelle. Yeah, and, and by the way, Michelle is a, a warrior. Uh, and I don't know if you probably all have seen her stuff. I mean, she's on it all the time. Um, and she is just a complete warrior. And we just love her to death. And her, she's got a great family. They're super people. Um, so, but here's uh, one thing I want to do, you guys. It's it's three or it's, we got about two minutes with Laura. Laura has to go. She's got another presentation to give today. And so I'm going to give her two minutes and just a second, Laurel, and you're, you're going to be on the, on the go here. Uh, so we're going to go Laurel to ask her question and then Laura uh, finish up in the next two minutes. And then uh, we're going to excuse Laura. We appreciate you so much, Laura. I'm not joking. It's a big, big deal. And then we'll finish up. So Laurel, go first. Laura, I just wanted to encourage you, if you see any of the positions, um, to let them know that it's unrealistic to tell a patient that they're going to have 100% recovery. And I sure wish that um, on Thanksgiving Day last year, uh, two physicians would not have told me that because that's just mean and it's downright wrong. And I was told that. And I wish they wouldn't have told me that because I'm not 100%, you know, I'm pretty good. You know, I've got, you know, my cognitive abilities and I'm a marriage and family therapist wanting to work with stroke couples. That's my desire now. Um, but I am, I feel ripped off. Like I feel ripped off that they told me that. And um, quite frankly, I wish I could speak to them today. I mean, you know, what they should have said, the wording should have been, you know, like you'll be a hundred percent maybe of your new, your new way of being, but to say, like, I was, I was going back to my old way and saying, Oh, I'm going to be like able to walk perfectly and hike perfectly and do everything that I used to do. And I had hiked the South sister, like a month before I'm extremely active, like extremely active. And I just feel like, you know, I'm still quite active, but not a hundred percent. And I, and I, I just want to say like that, I feel like I wish, you know, I was at, um, you know, nothing about Mackenzie Willamette, but I wasn't at peace health. I'm down in Springfield. And I just, I kind of wish they wouldn't have said that. And, um, they gave me some timelines, you know, Oh, in two months. And then I got to two months and I'm like, Oh, not a hundred percent. That's weird. And the three months came and I was, you know, so that's all I want to say, but thank you for joining our group today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm really sorry that that was, you know, portrayed in that manner. I think, um, you know, again, when you look at um, the brain being so complex, it's it's really impossible to know what will happen with what what person. Um, and from the neurologists I've I've worked with, who I think are wonderful. Um, that's always been the message is that, you know, each, each of us is individual. And, and in many cases, you will never be the same exact person you were before this. And even if your brain chemistry looks exactly the same, you just went through something that will forever change you. So, you know, there's, you know, I'm really sorry that that happens. Um, I think we as healthcare providers, like I speak for me and the people that I work with, I think we set the tone. Um, and I think sometimes we do a bad job of setting the tone. Um, so that's what I try to work on is making sure we set the tone to allow you to reach your highest potential with what has happened and allow you to feel supported and allow you to feel heard um, with what you're going through. Awesome. Well, I'm going to um, just say thank you so much, Laura. Uh, I know you have another meeting. It's been uh, such a pleasure having you. And it's been so nice to be able to have an open conversation about all of these things. Uh, it, it means the world to us. So uh, we hope you'll come back uh, down the road here. And um, thank you once once more, everybody, you know. 
Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. I'm going to make a quick, quick comment, Laurel. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'm a stroke survivor and I don't know everything and I'm just me. So take that for what it's worth. But the opposite is true as well. Uh, I was told you got a year and a half as good as it's going to get. And my business partners were, one of my business partners was in that appointment with me. And what do you know, a year and a half later, I was asked to leave my my own company uh, by my partners. So are they perfect? No. It, did it hurt? Yes. And it's going to be painful. And I'm so sorry about that, Laurel. But I'm so glad you're here with us because we care about you and uh, that's where you're going to find your difference. You're going to find your difference with people like us who have gone through the fight, are continuing to go through the fight and are finding our way. And you're going to find your way and it's going to be a better you. If I ask you this question in a year or a year and a half from now, you're probably going to tell me, good enough. I'm glad I went through it. I'm just telling you. So um, I, th I I'll be praying for you. I'll be thinking about you. We we care about you. So okay, all right. Sorry, I had to get on my that 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 hit a button with me. Everybody uh, has the purpose. Absolutely, Brian. Thank you. So um, last thing, um, I talked about the peer to peer mentoring uh, program. I'm really excited about it. Steve Van Houten uh, is heading that up and we are, of course, doing that. And so uh, you guys can always email me. Um, it's Keith at, um, oh, shoot, I didn't even rem remember my email address. Uh, there's Keith at strengthafterstroke.com if you want. But anyway, you can you can get a hold of me and, and uh, learn about more of that. Uh, Stroke Warrior Radio now, Ralph Cortez is doing that. And it's at... Um, www.strokewarriorradio.com. I should have had that on the site. But again, if you guys have any questions and it's it, it's in its infant stages, but it's growing. OK, and Jim Patterson, who's who's in here, uh, helped get that kicked off as well. Uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, are there any other stroke? Did anybody have a stroke in October? Nope. Well, good. We'll just skip right over that one. <laughs> uh, next meeting, we're having Mike Studer. Oh, wow. Mike is a uh, very well-known PT. He's got about 15 million different uh, initials behind his name. He's a workaholic. Uh, he helped Jim Patterson specifically. And uh, Jim, if you got a second, um, What's our time? Why don't you give us two minutes about about uh, uh, Mike? Well, what I can say about Mike Studer is he is a clinician, a medical professional who always put the needs, wants, and desires of his patients ahead of his own. He he uh, he really understands how to push the right buttons when it comes to helping stroke warriors understand what their capabilities can be in the future. You know, the, the first thing he ever said to me after I had stroke, first time I met him, he challenged me to come up with three things that I wanted to be able to do again, knowing that I was going to be completely different physically and mentally. And he created a specific physical therapy regiment for me that was targeted and focused at me being able to accomplish those three things I told him, including being able to play 18 holes of golf again, which I do three days a week. Wow. Uh, Mike is one of the most intelligent people I have ever met. He is compassionate empathetic and not afraid to uh, let people know that when you're dealing with stroke it's medical malpractice to tell somebody 
they're as good as they're going to get. Mm. Equally so, it would be medical malpractice to tell someone they're going to be 100% in their recovery. So I hope that uh, Laurel has an opportunity to mention that during the meeting when Mike is on. I'd love to hear his response. I, I know it's not going to be uh, all rainbows and unicorns. He'll, he'll <laughs> tell it like it is. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you, Jim. Mike, uh, Mike, Mike was just, I mean, Mike is not well known. He's world renowned. He yeah. just spent two weeks lecturing in Europe. This guy is in high demand across the globe. And for Keith to be able to get him to be a part of our group and speak, phenomenal. Way to go, Keith. Good job. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. You know, uh, it's all where about is he, you guys. Keith? Pardon me? Keith, where is he? He lives in Bend and Portland, or Bend and Salem, excuse me. His, his, his home is in Las Vegas. Oh. But where does he practice? His, his practice was in Salem, but he is no longer in Salem. He has moved to Las Vegas, Nevada. I did not know that. Yeah, so uh, look him up, uh, John, if you'd like. Um, he's... Uh, he he's got a million initials. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Yeah, look cool. him up, Thanks. Uh, Mike. Yeah, he's a. I would a I would guy. encourage I would encourage everybody if they have the time, look up Mike Studer and his TED Talk. Yeah. Yeah, great guy. So we're really excited to have him uh, come on. And so anyway, um, when I when I reached out to him, he was in another country when I reached out to him. So uh, anyway, uh, last last thing is, you know, I just want to say to everybody here, you know, I, I hope you realize how much we appreciate each and every one of you guys. Um, this is a big deal. And um, I feel like we're, we're making an impact. We record our meetings. We send them out. I know I've said this before, but on my own YouTube channel, uh, I had over 80 people watch um, our last recording. And so, you know, um, it's important that we get the message out to people about what they can get to, how they can grow. And listening to each and every one of you guys talk is so critically important because everybody relates to somebody different. Uh, so with that... I want to thank each and every one of you guys, and I hope you come again, and uh, we will talk soon. Any any last questions? No? All right. Have a thank great you. day. No, thank you. Good seeing you all. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.